Live tonight from the virtual Daytona International Speedway, we say good evening, Sim Racing fans, and welcome to the unofficial kickoff for the 2020 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. As we prepare for tonight's class exhibition, we welcome you into the iRacing Esports Network booth, where once again, along with myself, Evan Pasoko, happen to be joined by Tim Terry and Randy Chenneth as we prepare to embark Tim on an 11th season of eNASCAR iRacing competition. It all begins unofficially tonight with the clash. This is going to be a taste of what we're going to see next week at the season opener. There's been lots of hype in the offseason, especially coming after Zach Novak's championship in 2019. 2020 is going to be big, and Evan, it started off big day. And of course, the big news is new teams, new drivers, more to talk about. We'll talk about it throughout tonight as well as the season. But the news of the day is that NASCAR premier partner Coca-Cola will refresh this officially sanctioned eSports racing series in a multi-year entitlement partnership that makes this the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series. In today's to Randy, the series prize pool jumps to more than $300,000 with $100,000 of which going to our eventual series champion in Phoenix. Yeah, I mean, this. let's be real, this is probably the single biggest in history for this championship and, you know, the biggest, biggest stakes we've ever seen and a huge sponsor coming on board in Coca-Cola. I am so, so much looking forward to the future to what this partnership has in store. We'll officially kick off this 20-race road to the championship next week. That's two more races on this year's calendar than what the 18 that we saw last season also just announced today is that the last six races of this season will be broadcast on NBCSN. But right now, Tim, the drivers are running through the final warm-up session for the evening, qualifying having already taken place. As we get set for this 50-lap contest, let's take a look at our NASCAR iRacing Series starting grid, and it is going to be headed by Nick Ottinger. He'll get pole position in this one in the William Byron Esports entry 47 to 558. Steve Sheehan going to join him on the front row and you can see that the JTG Doherty entries get Jeremy Allen and Challoner in the top six. Yeah, and Jeremy Allen's a former winner here at Daytona when it comes to this eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series. So keep an eye on him. Ray Alfala is also a former winner here when it comes to Daytona a couple of times over. So there's some very stout names that have qualified up front for this clash. Continue it on down through the running order. You see Phil Diaz, Chris Overland on row number four. Ashton Crowder, you see the Burton Clearman entry. Row six, he'll be joined by Michael Guest. The 33 car for Team Dillard Esports rolling it in the number 12 spot. John Gorlinski, teammate to our post at Randy, then back on row seven. Yeah, a handful of interesting names back here too. Eric Smith, Logan Clampett back here as well as Malik Ray, Yarl T, and Anna Alex McCollum. Row nine, a couple of teammates getting paired up there as we get deeper into the field. Still some big names hanging out in your mid-pack. And you can see some of those drivers uh, with newly partnered teams. A lot of the drivers moved around. Only three teams stayed the same from last year. You see Garrett Lowe in the Wood Brothers racing car. He'll be on roll up with Jake Nichols just ahead of Justin Bolton back along with Nathan Lyon on row 12. Continue it on through the second Gibbs game in the car. Graham Bolin did well in last night's practice race. He's on the inside of row 13. Look at row 14, though. That's going to be a stout Richmond Raceway eSports lineup for this season. Reigning champion Zach Novak and Jimmy Mullis comprise row number 14. Casey Kerwin right in behind him. They're going to be really solid this season as you look through the balance of this field. A couple of Latardi sports entries towards the back there with Chris Sherbert and Santiago Tiraz, who makes the jump to the series for this season. Another new team there, KLRA Sports, has Bob Bryant on the inside. At end of the very last row, Michael Guerrilla will roll with Jim Beaver Esports in row number 19. So 38 of the 40 competitors competing tonight. We are only without Brad Davies and Brian Schoenberg, who we'll see next week at Daytona. But let's take a look at that 20 race calendar that we'll see throughout this season. Again, two more races than what we saw last year, Randy. And on the left hand side, obviously, the clashy unofficial opener there's an all-star race mix in there as well but to keep up with changes on the nascar cup series schedule looks a little bit different than what we saw last year yeah i mean a couple new tracks in there as well you know phoenix definitely the uh, big one ending in the year there it's gonna be uh, gonna be really weird as well going to homestead in march i'm not gonna lie about that but three plate tracks all making an appearance you see daytona there of course of the season opener then on august 25th and october 1st as well that's gonna be a big talking point for these guys as we get in the middle and uh, latter parts of the championship yeah, the All-Star Race tucked in there as well. Indianapolis, New Hampshire returning to the schedule. Three plate races, Talladega and then Daytona twice. But that second Talladega, notable team, because that comes as a cut race. Vegas goes from you know that spring date to the fall date. 
outside of our playoffs. That will be the first of our six races at the end of the year that are on NBCSN. But you want to talk about Talladega being the race that determines our eight-car playoff grid. Uh, certainly going to be a stress-inducing race for the drivers if that eight to ninth position for points still up for grabs when we get there. You look at those last few races, Evan, that really put that heart rate up a little bit, trying to get yourself into the playoffs. You really start with New Hampshire on the left-hand side of that screen. Uh, tracks like Michigan, Watkins Glen, Daytona, uh, Vegas, Darlington, some really different racetracks. And then you mentioned going to Talladega as that cutoff race. If it wasn't intense enough that you had to make it in to that championship eight, it's definitely going to be all on the line when we go to Talladega. If it's anything like this draft package that we have now with Daytona, you're going to see some intense three and four wide racing there. And uh, we're going to get a little bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a taste here this evening before we go into Daytona. And if the practice races and these warm-ups were any indication, three, four wide, uh, edge of your seat racing, let's put it that way. Absolutely. We still have two road course races on the calendar this year. The Roval sticks in a playoff spot, although this year it will be the first race of the playoffs. So if any of our road course ringers are in those playoff eight, that could be a really good opportunity for them to either just get ahead in the points or to get that win and lock themselves into to the finale at Phoenix. We'll touch on the Phoenix as well at the moment, but another change is Sonoma, which we saw last year, would buy Bobby Zelensky off. And instead, we return it to Watkins Glen. Randy we will both have to wait, though, to the second half of the year before we get into those right and left turns. Yeah, Watkins Glen is going to be a very interesting track. Of course, much less technical than Sonoma. Sonoma, a lot more elevation change and definitely a lot more dynamic in terms of a road course. Watkins Glen is uh, probably one of the simplest, especially the couple out. Not as technical, you know, we're probably one of the least technical road courses uh, in the world, but it's going to provide a lot of fun. And there has been some great races in the uh, series history at that road course. I think back to 2016, uh, the uh, race with PJ Sturgios and Michael Connie coming down to a, a last corner bump and run with those two fighting for a championship. Uh, that is going to be a fantastic race in the middle of the latter part of the year. It's also been some time since we have seen a Phoenix on the calendar. 2017, I believe, last time it was in competition. Not to talk about Bobby Zelensky. I just mentioned it with Sonoma last year. Uh, he also won that Phoenix race. Uh, but as I mentioned, with some of those changes with the NASCAR Cup Series, Tim, Phoenix is now the last race of the year. So playoff structure remains the same. You see four races in the playoffs. Those first three races will be the round of eight. We'll use those three races to wither down the drivers to four. And it'll be a four-car championship take all down in Avondale, Arizona this time. Yeah, that's going to be a very exciting round to see who's going to take away that championship with the lights of NBCSN and everything on. It's going to be hard to top last year's battle, the last corner going down to the end of that race and the end of that championship in 2019. But you better believe these guys are going to be on their game, and especially at Phoenix. Everybody loves the Phoenix Raceway, and uh, we're going to get ready to go racing here at Daytona. You're going to have to wait until next Tuesday night to see all of these new cars painted up in those fresh looks, but you do get your first preview of all of the new team and driver lineups. As mentioned last year, we had 16 teams competing with us in this Edascar Coca-Cola iRacing Series. This year, 20 teams signing on. Five new teams joining the fray. So William Byron Esports, Stuart Haas Esports, KLR Esports, it's Kyle Larson, Denny Hamlin Racing, and the Virtual Racing School all jumping on board for this season. It means that all 40 of our world championship drivers are team affiliated, which I think is a great story. And listen, we mentioned there was a lot of movement. So tonight, and I think all season, maybe the first couple of weeks at least, Randy, going to be a learning process, not just for everybody at home, but for us getting acquainted uh, to the new colors and numbers as well. Yeah, I'm going to have a feeling that uh, for the first, not only tonight, but for the first couple nights, there's going to be a handful of us uh, maybe calling out the wrong teams for drivers or maybe even the wrong numbers with the uh, amount of people that have moved around. But you mentioned those new teams, and I love the fact, you know, you kind of look at those five rosters that we'll have here, and, you know, there's kind of a mix of, uh, you know, experience levels across those teams. A couple of those new teams, they have a lot of the young running in this series, a lot of the newer drivers, and a couple of those uh, new teams have some old talent as well, and even, uh, you know, kick, uh, Kyle Larson Racing Esports first final, Steve Sheehan and Bob Ryan, new driver and experienced driver in that lineup. A lot of mix and match in there, and cars roll off a bit really. Yeah, as they roll, let's talk more about this Daytona International Speedway. Two and a half miles in length, which means that tonight's 50 lap exhibition will be 125 miles. So the finish 31 degrees of making it close. In the trioval as well, conditions for tonight partly cloudy. Track temp not much warmer than it is. The atmospheric temp of 81 degrees Fahrenheit compared to 82 degrees track temp. But there is nothing on the line. But in some respect, there's a lot. And I think that sometimes Tim Bragged rates can be more uh, of a draw. We've seen this class three times in a row running. Taylor Hurst, Casey Kerwin, and Matt Busa, the winners of this race in 1918 and 17. 
But when you look at it, it's momentum. Evan trying to get in to the biggest series that the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series has had in history. You want that momentum going into race number one. You can definitely get it here if you can walk away with the clash. And we're getting ready to throw the green flag on this one. It's this big field of 38 round straight. 50 laps on the board from the World Center of Racing. And as we hope they will be joining us throughout the season from now through November. Happy that you're spending your evening with us on the RAC to Esports Network. Pace car going to dive down to the safety of Pit Road. If you're the William Byer and Esports Chevrolet of the 25 of Ottinger in control. As we say, let's go Clash Racing from Daytona. Green flag in the air for 2020. Let's see how quickly we're going to wait until they maybe see a, a third line pop up. You'll see a couple drivers, third in line, pops down to the bottom lane. That was a 37 for Christian Challenger. But right now, everyone being calm. A blue car mid pack looking at the third line for the most part. It's going to be by two the entire field. You can see the 32 pushing to one car up on the outside line. So that is Leahy giving the push to Sheehan as they race down the Daytona Super Stretch and off into turn number three. The one of Sheehan's got space on the inside, just shy of clearing that 25 down low. So we go side by side on the four to see who leads lap one. Ray Alfala moved to that outside line. He's third in the outside and now goes to the extreme outside with help from the 16 car of Chris Overland as they go to the outside and try to make something happen. Two former teammates from last year, Evan, on different teams this year, but trying to make the outside line happen here as you ride on board going down into corner number one with Keegan Lane. It's on board with the 32 Leahy. He's the second car in line in the middle of the three wide sandwich right now that comes out of turn number two. Still just the two of Alvala and the 16 car of Chris Overland on the buckle behind him. The VRS car pushed by the Wood Brothers race at entry, but they do have some support incoming. The 51 of Elite Ray being worked with by the 53 of Lusa, closing in, trying to give that outside line some support as the inside two lanes have a couple of car lengths of advantage. Yeah, those drivers, I thought, they're about to be five, uh, five more strong. There's two more in the back. They're going to be trying to get up there. Look at Eddie Hampton racing entry up there. He's going to hop up there. Let's be Leahy. So three wide across the, uh, the first six, seven rows here as they work through Audrey, though. If we get to the break away, but that's not going to be for a long. Look at the run in the middle lane. Get to the top. Big hit of speed as well. And it is just three laps into this clash, but already at a point where you can't make it in the States. Three wide, now some eight rows deep, down the back and into turn three. This is what we saw a lot earlier tonight in practice as well as practice yesterday. But wasn't sure if they were going to go at it right off the bat, but clearly these drivers came to race tonight. I'm not sure when we go for 250 miles next Tuesday, Tim, that it will be this crazy off the bat, but these drivers showing that they came to have some fun. Really, first opportunity they've had to get all 40 of their competitors almost with 38 starting tonight on the racetrack at the same time since we were in Homestead. Yeah, they're getting to showcase the product right now. We might not see this sense of urgency next week, at least this early in the event, as they continue to go three wide and back. It's got to two wide up in front with Steve Sheehan to the outside of the 25 of Nick Ottinger. Sheehan trying to go to the lead. It's two by two, and then row number three sees three wide as they continue around Daytona. This lead pack is basically everybody. All 38 cars last time by within two seconds unchanged of the race leader. As now you see a little bit of separation as Nick Ottinger back to the point after starting on pole. He's been pretty trying and true down on the inside. You go on board with Michael Gass of Brownsburg, Indiana. Back to 33 car third in line on the middle lane. Hey, he's doing everything he can to help the drivers in front of him. And Keep, especially, I think, that outside from pulling alongside. But look, a big head of steam get off the corner. That outside line is so good coming down the banking on the big head of steam. Like you see there, going to the turn three, it just runs a little bit out of steam as they get into the corner. And, well, that middle lane kind of uh, struggling a little bit as well to keep up with that bottom line. But as they say that, the run off of turn four is good. And Sheehan might have the lap led here at the strike. He's got a nose in front. That's the all-white car center lane. And he does. So Sheehan leads after five of 50 laps. Don't look now, though. That 32 with Keegan Leahy, the Denny Hamlet Racing Toyota leads up top, still pushed by Al Fala, and then a set of teammates, the 46 of Jimmy Mullis and the 90 of Zach Novak, defending champ. That's the Richmond Raceway Esports duo. They work the outside. The other duo of red cars working the bottom lane, as we mentioned on the green, Jeremy Allen, followed by the 37 of Challenger, the JTG Doherty Racing Cars. Yeah, you got a couple of teammates here in this lead pack, or at least at the front of the lead pack, battling it out and trying to get themselves towards the front of the field and looking at that inside line. Gets a little head of steam this time, and Ottinger will pick up the lead once again, but he's got those two JTT teammates right in behind. Sheehan pulls even with Ottinger as they go down into corner number one. We'll see if that outside line can get another head of steam here as we work off of two. 
they have the support again, and it was just those first two cars who made the move to the outside. Wasn't sure if it was going to be viable, but the problem is they almost accordion a little bit inside and out when they go in and out of the corners. They can't stay as close. Alfala is pushing that 32 as you know, Leahy into the corner, but on entry they separate. See the spacing between the 32 and the 2? They're a lot further apart than the first two cars, both in the middle and the bottom lane, and they lose all that time in the corner that by the time they've caught up on the straightaway, they're going to drop back once again on entry. Yeah, you got to think about engine temp as well. When you're that tightly packed together, it's, you know, cars three, four, five uh, cars deep in the line. You're going to start having engine temp issues after a handful of laps. So that's going to be something these guys on the outside line have to think about as well. Yeah, they're nice and neatly packed together for now, but the fact that this middle and bottom lane are able to stretch out where they are and still be dominant this early in the race, you may want to think about dropping back and maybe getting in the line or just settling out that top line a little bit. It is just lap eight of 50. Uh, it's just a straight up race to 50 laps here, no crazy format or anything like that. So that will raise the race and here we go. I just looked back to the field to say, well, where would safe be? The top 18 cars are all three wide right now. All the way back to Corey Vincent in the 27. The Renegades Ford, that time by 19th on track. He's the last of the three wide. So you'd have to go way back to get into the clear. But once we fall off of this three wide, you can see it on some of those wider shots. There is some single file back there. But everybody up front in line put on a clinic of what some three wide Daytona action should be. But then you see the lights right there. The eight of Conti, some of those other drivers, two wide, but most single file they're trying to get with the teammate they don't want to be a part of this this early on and that's just it it's early on in this race they could be hanging back just a little bit letting everything unfold in front of them and having something for the end of this race because we've seen some of these practices get a little wild and woolly and somebody makes that wrong move and it triggers that big one that we're used to seeing at daytona and talladega but michael conti former champion has been around daytona a couple of times in the series knows his way around and there is your leader nick ottinger looking back from that number 25 car back to the rest of this field and you can see all those cars tucked up tight as they come off the of two that was just thinking, Randy, next Tuesday, before we go racing, we're going to have to make our commentator picks, and a lot of people was thinking, well, Daytona's kind of wide open, so I guess you can really win it from anywhere, but so far, with this three wide locked in as tight as it is, as you see Leahy now move down to the middle line, behind the one car, she handed off of the nose of Alfala, so that blue Denny Hamlin racing Toyota comes down, the fact that the three wide hasn't allowed a ton of drivers to make big moves through the pack, we have seen Jimmy Mullis go 27th to 8th, Zach Novak 28th to 10th, 10th, but other than that, if you start a top 10, you're in a pretty good spot. Only Chris Overland has dropped back. He started at 8th position and runs right now in 31st. Of course, you can see that full running order at the top of your screen. Yeah, I mean, the pair of Richmond Race for East drivers, we take a look at Ray Reynolds here in the three. He's currently sitting 26th in the running order. He's got three spots from where he started, but those two teammates, Ramolis and Novak, they've made great headway already in this opening 11 laps. Another driver who's up a lot is the 17 of Colin Keister. He's up uh, about a half dozen or so spots from 31st up to 17th. And to the 25 of Ottinger, he had been able to lead that last circle around the racetrack. But Ottinger, I think he's going to be able to get this one to the 32 of Keegan. It's caught back up to the outside line. So I think that 32 didn't like whatever the uh, middle line was cooking and went right back up to the top and cut off the two. Yeah, he's not like he was the pusher there, so I don't think it was a 10 pitch. He talked back him on and maybe said, hey, I'd rather just be in control and hang out here on the third line. Typically, when you go super speedway racing on this iRacing service, the three wide is that pucker moment where you're very uncomfortable, but we have seen it literally every single lap since the start of this race. So far, clean and green through lap 12 of 50 in the class. The unofficial kickoff to this Edascar Coca-Cola iRacing Series campaign, and it has been Nick Ottinger leading on the inside. All night challenges have come from Sheehan, who's still right there into P2, but if you're the third or fourth car in any of these lanes, Tim, it's going to be awfully hard to get anywhere. Yeah, you're kind of boxed in right now. You can't really go anywhere. You have to rely on those lanes in front of you to move and maybe somebody to shift the lane and maybe you can move up just a little bit. But that's the product that we have right now early in this race. That sense of urgency is going to ramp up just a little bit as we get to the halfway point and a little bit closer to the end of this clash. But right now, these drivers up in front, they're content to ride there because they have that track position. Those guys that are near the back of the pack, they know that it's going to get there at the end. You're going to get some laps in and those guys are going to move a little bit closer towards the front of the field when the pay window begins to open. So, uh, uh, these guys right now content to ride, but yeah, if you're in the middle of the pack, you have to believe you're gonna, you know, maybe make a move or two, or maybe try something here, especially in this clash, to prepare yourself for next week. And you want to talk about, you know, drivers working together and whatnot as we go on board with the Stuart Haas, sports car tucked in the middle there. That's the foot of Dylan Duvall on board with him. He's fourth in line on the middle. You're looking up at the back end of the 33 of Michael Guest, that old black entry 
for this series clash. We have those Richard Raceway cars lined up for the outside. On the inside, you've got the JTG Doherty Racing cars lined up. I have a feeling if I'm Jeremy R. Allen, who makes his return to this Coca-Cola series this season after a hiatus, re-qualifying in through the Pro Series, if they could just get rid of Nick Ottinger, they'd be real comfortable holding 1-2 on the inside line. It's basically perfect positioning where you and your teammate want to be on a race here at Daytona, but because the 25 cars there, they're not able to do it right now. Talking about the three wide, it looks just like you'd see at a Cup Series weekend. Well, you can do this even if you're on your own now because AI has expanded two ovals for the first time. NASCAR Cup Series cars are available for AI competition on iRacing just in time for Speed Weeks with the launch of the two biggest super speedways on the schedule, Daytona and Talladega. Load up the beta UI and go iRacing with AI today. I'll tell you what, it's awfully fun. I wonder if these drivers might use that to get some practice in. But at least in this clash, all these drivers representing their teams trying to put on a show and look at Cattell, jumps to the outside, comes right back down, leapfrog Steve Sheehan, he now leads the middle lane. He definitely would have liked to get the 25 uh, down there as well, Bonger, but not quite able to do it. Let's see if he can get a run off the uh, exit of turn two, but the 32 at Keegan Lake, he gets big speed up there with a few of Ray Alfala pushing him as they scream down the back straightaway, getting ready to head into three. They're clear of Bonger, I think, just. I think he could jump down if he wanted to, but I think that's a wise uh, call there by Brandon to not just immediately hop down there. It would have been a tight move, and 35 laps still left to uh, go, and this coming to 34. Don't know if you want to be cutting your margins that close just yet. And especially because he doesn't have a teammate behind him, I thought that maybe that would have been an indication that he'd be less inclined to stick around, but opting to stay in the middle lane for the moment, so it's still on Julie to the bottom. The 14 of Cattell now leads the middle, and on the outside line, the 32 car of Leahy leading that third and very outer lane. Look at the one car now. He wants to go for some payback. He'll step in a line on board with the 32 here. He'll push Sheehan down the back straight away, off into turn three, but not clear in time. Try to move that same move on Cattell that Cattell did to him, wasn't able to do it, and now he leads the outside line. And shorter way around the, on the inside, Nick Ottinger looked like he had a run through three and four, but Steve Sheehan going to take that outside line and take it back to the lead position with Keegan Leahy giving him a little bit of a push. Brandon Cattell in the middle, trying to get a little bit of help from the 33 of Michael Gaston behind Dylan Duvall and Ryan Boonsa in the middle of that pack as well on that middle groove as they work around. And the 17 is also there as well. That's Colin Keister. Evan, he started back in 31st position. He's all the way up to the uh, knocking on the door of the top 10 as you ride on board with Steve Sheehan looking back at Keegan Leahy and the rest of this field. And you can see get awfully close with that left rear quarter panel there as Sheehan works the top side. The Kyle Larson Racing Esports entry. Not very good through four that time. But again, that's where this outside line struggles is in the quarter. They do have the advantage of kind of running down those 31 degrees of banking. That kind of builds that momentum back up. But, uh, but essentially, a lot of the time, it's kind of a zero net loss or gain. On board now, Colin Keister, top three wide. That's the number 17 car for Roush Fenway Gaming. The outside's actually opened up to his outside if he wants to go there. Only three cars that you all see there right front to him on the outside as that top lane has lost a bit of momentum. Yeah, that outside, I mean, it's not just losing momentum, it's losing drivers. There's only three cars, there's going to be a fourth one joining up, but it was just a handful of laps ago. We had five, six, seven cars populating that outside line, and those numbers just aren't there anymore, and you're going to start to see as they come off of turn four, they're going to start to struggle because of that, because look at all the cars you have in the middle, and especially the bottom. I think half the field is up against the yellow line right now, where everyone else kind of split between the middle and top line. The bulk of those definitely in the center there. And it's kind of now just waiting for the next ball to drop as the outside starts to deteriorate. They are back to four cars, and that's because we have another two-car tandem of the VRS entries, the two, and behind him, the 83. So while Fallon and Zelensky working together, with that outside line losing numbers, how long is it going to stick around? Or will maybe they should decide to cut their losses if they lose too much time at tuck in line? You're on board and both in the sim rig with the 46 car of Jimmy Mullis. He runs at 18th position. One of the cool things we'll be bringing to you all season long on the Iron City Sports Network is those in-shot looks, not only with the car on the right-hand side, but at the driver at home on the left side. And you can see that his eyes locked in. Looks like he's quiet on the radio right now as he's working in the middle of all this chaos, now tucking down to the inside. And we saw him chatting, presumably, with his teammate Zach Novak. And they're friends off the racetrack. They're teamed up together. That's going to be a dangerous combination for Rich Richmond Raceway Esports as we work through this 2020 season. Malik Ray, always a threat when we come to the Super Speedway. Stuck in the middle right now, though. He's got some traffic to contend with as he looks up for about six rows or so as they work their way around three and four. Got that 55 to the inside. Kane Cook starting deep in this field, Evan. He's knocking on the door of a top 10 run. 
He is closing in. We've started to see this field loosen up a little bit. Drivers be able to make it through the field. We've called out a couple of them. There's a move to the outside. Now Michael Gast jumps up from behind Cattell, but it is right on quarter entry. So any momentum that he gained by jumping up there kind of dies off a little bit. He'll look for the speed now off of turn number two to try to challenge on the outside, but not able to do it yet. And they stay in that deadlock for the moment. Yeah, and that outside line kind of lost momentum a little bit as we check into the 23 of Casey Kerwin's currently sitting in 26. He definitely seems calm at the moment, Evan. Just relaxing. I think he's just happy uh, sitting body his time right here in the mid pack. And that's what seems to see because you can kind of see the first 15 or so 20 cars. They're all tightly packed together as you get to the head of the field. But once you get to the mid pack on back, everyone's kind of spaced out a little bit. I think a number of drivers may be a little bit nervous about the way the race is going up at the front of the field, three wide and so uh, tightly on top of one another. I think we have more than a handful of drivers that are just sitting in the back and uh, waiting and expecting something to happen in front of them and just wanting to keep themselves out of potential trouble that might be brewing. Almost halfway home, Tim, in this 50-lap contest, working lap number 23 of 50. Where do we sit on the pitch strategy? Are we looking at a one-stopper? Yeah, I believe we are. I'm sure we're going to see some of these drivers uh, play some strategy here a little bit later on. And uh, You look at the front of this field right now. You want to talk about strategy. Guys like Nick Ottinger, Jeremy Allen, uh, Steve Sheehan, they're all great at Super Speedway Racing. And there's a couple in the back coming down onto pit road, as you mentioned it, Evan. So a couple of these drivers at the back calling an audible coming down onto pit road. But strategy, these guys know how to play it. It's going to be hard, though, if you're up in front to relinquish that lead, especially when you have a couple of teammates working with you. I think the reason an outside line fell apart a couple of laps ago is because Novak and Mullis bailed those Richmond Raceway cars. They are some of the drivers down to pit road. Corey Vincent also into the box. Logan DeClampett. So four drivers coming in just shy of halfway home in this clash. I wonder if the rest of the field is going to stick with this and pit roughly halfway again. It is not a big difference in fuel being able to go to the end of the race. So in theory, you could have pitted 10 laps in. You could have pit with 10 to go. Another time by pit road. Looks like no takers from the lead pack this time as we continue to fight for the lead. That 33 car guest still leading the third and outside lane. A little bit of a bobble as Sheehan got awfully close with the ball. Nearly came down on the inside. Yeah, margin is starting to get tight approach halfway and actually people thinking about coming down towards pit road thinking you'd be really really interesting here i know historically here at daytona in this championship pitting early tends to a really reward you and kind of get back up on the racetrack and when everyone else is getting up to speed you can kind of have a full head of steam and be able to draft by them we nearly saw the race last season come down to a decision like that before some late race cautions but uh it's amazing to see does anyone duck down underneath the yellow line this time off of turn four answer to that question is going to be no everyone keeps it up on the racetrack Almost looked like Phil Diaz wanted to. That white number 75 for Mode Motorsports kind of tucked those left side tires below the double yellow. He doesn't have his teammate with him, so it was maybe fishing for some support, but nobody made the jump with him. His teammate is Jake Nichols in the number 24 car, who is running back in 30 second spot. So that's one of the challenges when you're on your own. If you don't have any official allegiance with somebody or any friends maybe outside of your team near you as well that you can talk with about this, you're kind of guessing. And yes, short pitting, I tend to be a fan of that call because you get the fresher tires sooner but at Daytona it's unique because you can't just pit by yourself and expect to compete those four cars who pitted really need to work with one another to not get lapped they're all single filed up the last lap for the last car in that group Corey Vincent was a 26.3 but your race leaders running a 45.7 so they're almost a second faster so those cars who pitted are losing time to those cars who stayed in this lead pack you hit the nail on the head. 34 drivers still have a sniff of this draft up in front, so you really don't want to peel off as one driver. Let lets that car wander down towards that inside line and flirt to that yellow line down the back straightaway as we continue down into turn number three. And Evan, I know Randy talked about strategy a couple of years ago. Nick Ottinger used some strategy along with uh, Michael Conti to put himself up in front in a winning position here at Daytona. Nick Ottinger up in front once again, showing the way. You have to believe that with his super speedway prowess, his pit strategy that he's exhibited here in the past, He's going to be tough to beat on and off the racetrack. And especially staying up front on that inside line. That car looks stout this evening. He might be tough to beat tonight. He might be tough to beat next week, too. Been three wide basically all night, but starting to siphon down to two by two as we still wait for the field to come down for pit stops. We're working lap number 28 of 50 in the EDASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series Clash.
six more cars just now diving down to pit road, but for the most part, that lead pack is still intact. We've seen a group of cars pit here, a group of cars pit there, but still waiting on that big influx of drivers to decide that they need the one stop necessary to get to the end tonight. You were just on board on the outside of a Sheehan. The 32 car still up there. That's Keegan Leahy. More cars down drive in from the back of this lead pack, but it looks like most of our contenders, Tim, opting to push this thing as long as they can before having to come down. And they can go another eight to 10 laps or so, stretching that fuel to come down onto pit road, but we anticipate some of these drivers down a little bit sooner rather than later. That outside line, that third groove, fizzling a little bit over these last few laps. It still leaves Nick Ottinger, it still leaves Jeremy Allen, Christian Chalner on the inside and leading that inside pack. Brandon Cattell has held that it middle groove for a while and now the 17 to the outside. Colin Keister trying to get up here and make something happen for the lead as they go four wide. Yeah, it was really tight with the 75 car getting lapped. Phil Diaz, I believe, having just completed service with no drafted help. That's the speed difference between being in the pack or being on your own. Everybody able to make it on through safely. They all clamped down on that man right there. The four-time series champion in Ray Alfalarandi did not make the top 20 in this Coca-Cola iRacing series last season and requalify into the Pro Series and win a Pro Series championship. He's working with his teammate Zelensky on the inside in this lead pack as now we look back at some of the cars who have pitted and are trying to get some draft working on their own. But again, those five, six cars there, you can be as lined up as you want. There's the four cars behind them that pitted even earlier. You can draft perfectly. Five cars ain't gonna be as fast as this, but race leaders down pit road. Here comes Ottinger on the brakes, locks it up awfully tight, but he's got some takers joining him. Yeah, that was an exciting trip down towards pit road. All Almost everyone in that lineup was sideways. The 18 pulls up into his box. Going to be getting service. That's Grant Bullen actually misses his box in a huge way to Grant Bullen. That's going to be his race over if we don't have a yellow. But something to think think about here is those drivers that pit early, the likes of Mullis, Vincent, Clampett, and Novak, that first group that we saw come down pit road, they've been out there circulating three to four tenths of a lap off the pace of the entire rest of your pack. So they're nearly three seconds back from the group that has just recently come down pit road. And uh, that group is probably going to cycle in with the likes of uh, everyone else that's now coming off the pit road, the likes of Jeremy Allen, Christian, uh, Christian Challoner, and Santiago Tires, but man oh man what a trip entering pit road there for those guys they got themselves in line and look at this is doing to the head of your field as well everything all stretched out as Dylan Duvall now leads that was nearly a wreck. I believe it was Luza came down on the inside line, checked up, almost got turned by Leahy, and it was pretty chaotic through the trioval as some of the race leaders split away again. But I'm surprised we didn't see you know, a 15-car group or a 20-car group come down to him. It has been those four or fives at a time. I think we're lucky to have avoided that one without an incident because that looked awfully sketchy. But this lead pack gets smaller and smaller. Here come more cars down pit road, led by Duval. Some cars swing way to the inside and way over speed, the 17 at Keister. He may have gotten caught at the line. Both he and the 41 smoking the tires. Yeah, a couple of close calls coming down onto pit road, but now up in front, it's the KLR Esports teammates, the one, Steve Sheehan, the 42 of Bob Bryant, trying to make their way around here in front of the 21 of Garrett Lowe. There is a driver that switched teams after having such a good season in 2019. Garrett Lowe right now in position number three, and your champion, Michael Conti, from a few years ago, runs in fourth. Did you see that big pack coming off of pit road? We'll see if these drivers decide to duck down here. They're going to have to in the next five laps or so if they don't right here, and most of them will come down onto pit road. It's going to be led by two teammates, and Sheehan and Bryant, who locks it up on the top and I think he got it down to pit speed of 60 miles an hour in time, but he had an early pit stall, so he really had to slow that thing down. So more drivers tuck in. Most all of these cars going with the same semblance of service, getting fuel to go to the end of this race as well. Uh, in some cases, taking tires, but it looks like a lot of the cars in this time through just for gas only. More cars now down pit road with low and these drivers cycling out, and I think we may have reached the end, if not being awfully close to our fuel window. As you'll see that 33 car come by the start finish line. Ian Michael Guest is a four car pack here with Keister, Duval, and Ray. They were scored eighth on a racetrack last time by, and maybe, I think the leaders, when this all cycles through, let's watch for cars coming up on the apron. I don't like how that quartet of drivers isn't grouped up. They're kind of just two by two, and that's going to be costing them speed. They're going to try to work the outside, though. They might be able to make this work and scream on past everybody. So the 17 is going to go to the head of the field here as they enter turn three, and I think they'd have a bigger advantage if they were single file, but they're going to just about clear the entire field as they now work off of in towards uh, corners number three and four. We'll see who your leader is going to be. It looks like it's going to be the 21 to Garrett Lowe. Bob Bryant should be second to come across the strike. 
now we take 12 laps to go in this race and it's time to pick up the pieces because you can see all these cars are still nice and tight the top 24 within two seconds but they're not two or three wide yet now we are for the race lead though as that 42 trying to block the middle it's keister to the very outside he'll get pushed by malik ray and the outside will freight train on the super stretch Colin Keister to the lead, but not for long, because now Malik Ray drops on his door. He'll be pushed by Michael Guest. And now you have to find your teammates. Who are you going to dance with here for these last 12 laps? I see the Stuart Haas eSports teammates are there as well. They're on different lines right now, though. The 41 Duval on the outside being pushed by the 14 of Brandon Cattell. Cattell was up here earlier leading this train around. Colin Keister is your leader. Malik Ray, always strong here at the Super Speedways. He's up here side by side. And Bobby Bryant to the inside, the 42 pair, battling for position number two. Stuart Haas eSports duo on the outside. You're on board with the lead car. Then Bolton was pushed by teammate Duval with the third. 33 of Michael Guest jumps up now becomes the lead car on the outside and I was just talking about picking up the pieces didn't take too long there is that massive three wide lead pack once more everybody lined back up for 11 laps to go we've been green up until now but with things getting to this stage in the race I at least one starts to wonder are there going to be some aggressive moves here that might end in tears here the 51 able to eat down an advantage Malik Ray leads that trip around the racetrack but now the 17 of Colin Keister he's going to get the push and be able to go right out in front of Malik Ray nearly able to clear and then maybe uh, would have been able to manage that middle line a little bit but man oh man all three manufacturers at the head of the respectable lines four down to the bottom Toyota in the middle and Chevy up top and that 33 has a bit of a head of steam but just can't quite pull alongside the 51 of Malik Ray I still think they need another car or two out there to be really good on that upper lane. I think this may be a preview of what we see next week, Tim. We talked all night about how there was a couple of drivers who made big gains from the 20s and high 20s to get up front, but for the most part, if you started up front, you were running up front, and it was hard for cars to make moves when the field was three wide and there wasn't a lot of space. The last time by, the top 10 cars on track all started 16th or worse in the race. That includes Paul and Keister, who leads. He started 31st. Bob Bryant's in third, starting 35th out of 38. So maybe a preview for next Tuesday, where pit cycle execution is the biggest determining factor if you're in the picture late. And you see these drivers just missed it on pit road. They're outside of the 28 car lead draft. We started 38 this evening, Evan. We're down to 28 in the lead draft. And then this would be your second pack led by Logan Clampett, the Richmond Raceway eSports teammates in there as well, battling it out. But the one thing that you mentioned about that lead pack, Nick Ottinger, who was so dominant early on that inside line, he's mired in traffic. We talked earlier about having to try to navigate traffic. He hasn't been able to get back up into the top 10 as of yet. Knocking on the door last time by 14th. He's fourth on that outside line, pushing those Stuart Hawks esports teammates and trying to get them to the front and himself to the front as well. We saw that move by the 2014 series champion Michael Conti in the right junior motorsport Chevrolet Camaro. He comes down to top Malik Ray and now leads that middle line. The outside losing a little bit of speed but here comes Kerwin to the very outside in the 23 Toyota. He has not been afraid of being in the mix tonight of course kind of taking the, day, the spot from his teammate who we saw up on that very outside a little bit earlier along in the other Denny Hamlin racing Toyota now working the outside, leading on the third lane. Inside of 10 laps to go in the clash. Is this lead pack, though, a ticking time bomb? As we race to turn three, 200 miles an hour and three rows wide. Yeah, that number 23 at Casey Kerwin, he's really found his stride in this championship, hasn't he? Last year, picking up his first career win at Bristol, nearly picking up a win as well at Pocono in a fight he barely lost out to with Jimmy Wallace. Look at the eight, Michael Conti going up, trying to shot the nose of uh, Casey Kerwin there and keep that uh, upper lane's momentum in check. Needs to be careful though, because the 51 of Malik Gray is going to have a run, and if Michael wants that middle lane, he's going to have to get there early, but I think he wants to be top. So an instant call there with a junior motorsports driver there, Evan, to go up to that upper line and voluntarily be in that upper lane. We see the middle and the bottom, I think, generally be better, but Conti going up to the top. You may have felt that if the outside line was unoccupied, somebody would have an ability to get ahead of him, tuck down in front, but his concern may need to be that if the middle line pulls an advantage a couple of times tonight, Tim, we see right where that black number three car is in line here. So that is the second spot in line in the middle, currently occupied by Blake Reynolds. We've seen a handful of times that car jump up to the outside once it's clear the third lane, kind of abandon the car in front of them to get a big run. So Conti really needs to make sure he can keep a nose in front of those cars on the middle to remain competitive. We haven't 
haven't seen a ton of side drafted. Watch there in the corner. They start pretty wide on the entry to one, and they walk it down the hill until they get about the center as they try to restrict the space that those cars underneath them have to work with. That's only going to get more and more strict as this race continues to close in. The next time by, see five laps to go. Yeah, you saw that squeeze through one and two that last time by Michael Conti trying to get that run down the back straightaway and Colin Keister through three and four to the inside is going to continue to lead. Michael Conti going to try to pull a little even down that uh, short stretch to the start finish line. The 51 of Malik Ray in the middle and we're three wide stacked five deep down into corner number one. We'll see if Conti can play that squeeze play a little bit down to the inside, get that side draft and try to get something down the super stretch. There's a lot of team cars close. Reynolds in the pack with Guest, but not together at the moment. The Kyle Larson cars close in the pack, not together. Really only seen those uh, cars on the very outside line in the 10 and the 41 actually lined up with one another. So there's going to be very limited options for drivers staying loyal with one another. You mentioned the different manufacturers on the front row. Ford, Toyota, Chevy, top to bottom. But with all the different teams in the mix, there aren't really any allegiances here. So do we stay at three wide or does somebody dare Try to put a fourth in there. Anything they can do to see some daylight. Yeah, I think the teammates that are closest together are the uh, the uh, Team Dillon Esports uh, teammates. The three and the 33 of Michael Guest and Blake Reynolds. They're relatively close to one another, but they're separated by lane at the moment. And one in the middle, one up top. So if they're able to pair up, maybe they can work together. But I think at this point, Evan, you're almost past the point of trying to link up with a teammate and being able to work with them. You're now quickly getting into the threshold of it's every man for himself in this teammate. Just work whatever you lane, whatever lane you think is going to uh, be going fast and try to keep it there. And hopefully you get in whatever position you can get. I think that the time to find your teammate was in those opening 30, 35 laps to what have you to try to coordinate for the pit stop. So after that one and only stop, you could get out together and then you could make your charge. It's going to be awfully difficult even for the VRS cars with Alfala on the inside, or the middle line, I should say, and Bobby Zelensky on the bottom. They're close, but you can't really just switch lanes freely. Look at the 51 now, Malik Ray ran the middle line, but moved up off of the corner to block Conti. Now he'll come back down to block Blake Reynolds. He's trying to police that lead lane, all three lanes wide as he tries to control the field, but he's unable to keep ahead of Colin Keister, who finds himself but it was in front, this time by looking for popsicle sticks in the air. Keister has been really strong on that inside lane, especially coming off of four, but Malik Ray will get that run. He'll lead that lap there, but Colin Keister has had a run the last couple of times through three and four. Michael Conti's going to have to try to make it happen on the outside line. Randy Tocco, teammates lined up, the only teammates that are lined up uh, in the front. Stuart Haas Gaming and G2 Esports, but they're outside the top ten right now. If you're going to make a move, you've got to make it now. Down the super stretch, Conti going to try to make a little bit of a squeeze down to three. We still need to make it to the white flag for this race to be official, so still nothing guaranteed as they start to topsy-turvy a little bit more in the pack. Still three wide, some seven, eight rows deep. Colin Keister, though, going to put 49 laps behind as we take the white flag presented by iRacing. Your top three separated by 17 hundredths of a second as they came across the stripe, nose to nose to nose, as they work into the 33 degree banking in corners number one and two. The 17 ekes out the advantage on the bottom, taking the short round, but the eight, we've seen the head of Steve Eaton get in the top line, but Malik Gray is going to chop it. He's going to find the outside wall after getting tagged. They're going to fan out four wide. They stack up, John deep for position. Everyone's in it. No one's missed this. Who is going to win as they get to the strike? He's direct and thought that he may have been clear. John Gorolinski's ahead of them all at a turn number four. Is he going to be able to limp on to win the clash? A faster car behind, Challenger too far, and John Gorolinski from 16th at the white is going to win the Coca-Cola clash. Wow, what a finish to that one. Have we ever seen a Daytona finish that wild in the series history before? John Gorlinski coming back into this series. He's going to go to victory lane in the clash, and he's going to have that momentum coming up for next week. Christian Chalder, Logan Clampett, Zach Novak, Bobby Zelensky, your top five. I don't think any of those drivers were anywhere near the top five when we threw the white flag. It looked like that it was just going to be Malik Ray who would have gotten into the outside wall. There was contact pushing down the back straightaway between he and the eight car, Michael Conti. He hit the wall, tried to come back down. Conti had filled that hole, and he kind of accepted it and stayed on the outside. The problem was the 23 car, and not at any fault of his own, I should mention, but Casey Kerwin sees a car on the wall, moves down a little bit, hits Ray Alfala, and that's what it kicks it off. Let's take a look at the instant replay here to see what happened down the back straightaway. It all starts with the 51. 
one. Right there on the outside. Contact with Conti. He's in the wall. The outside pinches down. It's the great car of Alfala who gets knocked into the bill line. And it is on from there. But that's Gorlinski in the 97 from the inside to the outside. He's in the rack. Got put in the wall. But he was able to keep that car straight and somehow able to limp it home. What a run there for John Gorlinski coming back into this championship after a long hiatus and ends up pulling out a late race, a late race win after that big issue. That's the best I've ever seen from the end of one of these talent of uh, Skimmy Day races. I think we nearly had the entire field involved in that one. I think the only cars that might it might have been the ones at the back that had gotten the pit strategy wrong, but that was about a 30-31 car incident coming to the checkered flag, and I don't think there's a straight uh, body panel left in the entire field after that. And I had thought that the two cars up top were going to get away with it as Gorlinski celebrates, but Akeister did get tagged. He would go on to collect Conti, and at that point, it was absolutely everybody involved in that one. Let's go on board with your eventual race winner as he continues to celebrate and see, Tim, what he saw down the back straightaway. Yeah, John Gorlinski was along for the ride for the most part of this. There's, you know, the racing going on in front of him side by side. Then everybody starts to wreck. He tries to park the waters here. Looks like he's through to the outside, trying to go down to the inside, back to the outside, gets around Conti, and ends up the lone driver in front and has to limp it home. Here's another look at it. And I think he locked out on the second one because that car was fishtailing through traffic. You see what happened to the three car there. You know, Gorlinski, I think, made that first move to the outside, Randy, to avoid it. I think that second move to the outside around, I think it was Conti, was just because that car got hit in the rear end and it got pushed up the hill. I don't think that it was necessarily by design, but as they say at Plate Track Racing, a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill, the best combination to have. Let's take a look at your EDAS Car I Racing Series unofficial results tonight from the Daytona Clash. It is John Gorlinski in the Chevrolet powered William Byron eSports entry who wins the rest of those intervals somewhat irrelevant because they were all damaged cars limping home. Chaloner, Clamp, and Novak, Zelensky, the top five. Yeah, I mean, in, it's almost none of your race leaders, was it, that we get uh, through here the top five into the top ten. Nick Ottinger, he led a lot of laps and he rounds out your top ten, but all those names in the top ten, Evan Kane Cook, we didn't see him up near the front of the running order all day. Alex McCollum as well, uh, pretty much all those guys. Even Zach Novak, Zach was in that group that we saw uh, get the strategy wrong on pit road, even the likes of Chandler and Logan as well. That entire sort of trio, they were in the they got that pit strategy wrong and they came home second, third, and fourth. You're going to have to continue to look down through the running order before you find the familiar name. Second half of the sheet here, Michael Conti was the driver who was on the front row, down the back straightaway. We thought he was in a good position. Ray Alfalo was right in the mix when this incident started. He was a rower two off of the very front. Had a really good shot at trying to race for the win in this one. And then some of the drivers who kind of made it through the wreck a little bit, Tim, the likes of you know Diaz and Bryant, who find themselves uh, able to get to the finish. So they technically don't DNF it. But, I mean, a lot of these cars were just limping home now as you look at the second half. Yeah, you look at the 21st through 30th on your screen, and uh, Casey Kerwin was up front, was in the top 10 when that wreck ensued. Uh, Graham Bolin, always a contender when we come to the Super Zubay's Limp Tome in 26th place. We talked about this lead pack being 28 cars strong before that wreck happened, and those guys that were outside end up coming home, some of them, for a top 10 finish. So uh, it's better to be lucky than good in some of these uh, occurrences, and you see it with some of those names near the front and some of them uh, near the back. Final sheet uh, for the results tonight as we scroll through and take a look at 31 through 38. Uh, those top 34 cars made it to the end. The first car who did not finish was Colin Keister. He was the leader entering turn three, got tagged by a speeded car from behind, and instead of a possible race win, he gets 35th place in the clash. He, Eric J. Smith, Chris Sherburn, and Nathan Lyon are the drivers who are unable to make it the distance. Again, this race clean and green throughout until we saw that absolute calamity on the back straightaway for that white flag lap. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, and we've seen that at Daytona here, uh, uh, Evan, especially with the season opener. Uh, we've typically have seen long green flag runs, so I'm not really surprised to see that happen here today. We've seen that third lane be a lot more relevant than it has been in years past, but in terms of having a long green flag run, uh, you know, really to start off the year here, uh, even though this is just a clash and not the season opener, you know, that's, that's pretty much in line with what we've seen the last handful of years. Let's take this opportunity now to talk with tonight's race winner, John Gorlinski, with 16th place and in the middle of the chaos when we took the white flag. And at the end, he's the winner of the Coca-Cola class. John, congratulations on this one. I'm sure coming to the white flag, you would have hoped that that was a possibility, but I don't think in a thousand years you would have thought it would have actually played out. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd be passing from 16th to first going into, into turn three like that. Uh, Obviously, that was pure luck, and I'd like to say it was skill, but I uh, did the equivalent of closing my eyes and just doing what I could to get through that. I managed to pinball correctly off everybody and uh, keep straight-ish. Straight 
Well, I know that this uh, would be a good result if this was next Tuesday. Unfortunately, you don't pocket the points, but how about a debut representative, of course, new team to the series, William Byron Esports, you making your return to this EDAS Car Coca-Cola iRacing series. And although it doesn't count for points, a checkered flag is a checkered flag. What was it like getting back out there with everybody? Uh, it's tons of fun. You, you actually kind of forget how competitive this field is. And even at Daytona, you can realize it real quick when we were all running 40 cars under a blanket. It was, I mean, it's chaotic. I, I made a mistake early on and had kind of shuffled myself to the back just to catch my breath and regroup. Um, I thought I had the right strategy. I was a little iffy getting into the pits and cost myself some spots. And by the last lap there, you know, you know, the next flag's going to end it. And uh, I saw everybody starting to dice up down the back stretch and just kind of chose the line I thought I was going to need to get through that. And I mean, got lucky. I just, I still can't believe the way that whole thing shook out. <laughs> Certainly the best possible case scenario. It's not a pretty looking car, uh, but it'll look good as you get the season to kicked off on Tuesday. But John, we appreciate the time. Congratulations on the win. Thanks a lot. Means a lot. Winner in tonight's Coca-Cola Clash. Continuing on down through the running order with, I believe, caught up our second place finishers, Tim Terry. Yeah, we've caught up with Christian Chalner finishing in position number two. And, and Christian, you ran up front during the first half of the race, but let's talk about that wreck at the end. Trying to avoid everybody and everything. Walk us through that last lap for you. Yeah, that, that was pretty wild. I mean, I was in that middle lane, and we, we kind of knew that at that point there was not really anything that you could do. Everybody was committed to their lines at that point, so really you, all you could do is push everybody forwards. Uh, and the past like laps before that everybody had been getting kind of a little bit more aggressive with it you've seen guys moving around a little bit more and it just started unfolding and the only thought is just keep the steering wheel straight because if you can get through the wreck straight even if the car is completely destroyed like it was you have a good chance of coming out of it okay and it, yeah there, there was there was no no skill to that at all it was just pure luck and i have no idea how we got through but i'm glad that we did so is this any indication of what we're going to see next week when we turn up the wick, pay some points, pay some money for the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series opener? Um, I think it's pretty pretty close to it, yeah. One of the big things tonight was it seemed like there was a lot of crosswind, and that seemed to be really stalling out the runoff of two. So in in previous races, we've seen where that, that very top line can get a really big run down the backstretch, but because that crosswind, it seemed like that just couldn't really build like it could uh, in other races. Now that's going to really play into it. And I, and I think that was a big contributor in, into why we saw it. it was very, very difficult in the early part of the run to, to pass the, the guys on the bottom lane. And that's, that's why we stayed there. We were quite happy to run third in line because we could see that nobody was cycling in front of us. Uh, and I think that's definitely something that people are going to need to keep an eye on. But overall, yeah, you're going to see a lot of three wide. Not sure about four wide. I don't think that'll really quite work, but definitely a lot of three wide next week. Well, Christian Chalner, second place. Great way to start off this season. Congratulations. We'll see you next week uh, when we throw the green flag at Daytona. Thank you, guys. That's Christian Chalner. And I know Randy has caught up with another driver that was in the mix. And it's Bobby Zielinski coming home with position number five. Yeah, driver, the number 83, Bobby Zelensky. Bobby, I know it's normally Casey Kerwin on his stream that everyone kind of likens to Steve, Mc, uh, to, excuse me, to Lightning McQueen, but down there on the infield grass in three and four, you look a lot like Lightning McQueen turning right to go left on the bottom and avoiding all the wrecks, and you still managed to not miss it, still got up into it, but managed to get yourself a top five. Talk me through that last lap trip through the grass. Dude, that was awesome. I, it's, it's really cool when the whole field wrecks and you you get wrecked, but you're still like fifth. And I could have been honestly second round uh, where Challenger was, but uh, <laughs> I got uh, Kane. It, it was a big wreck. Kane got wrecked into me, and I went flying up the track. So, boy, that was just fun. We didn't wreck the entire race. It was really tight, three wide racing the whole time. We waited till the last corner. That's perfect, honestly. And how are you guys as a driver is liking this package? Because it seems like we're seeing that upper lane be way more relevant than it has been in years past. Do you guys enjoy the three wide for 50 straight laps or is it a little bit more stressful than uh, maybe, some, maybe some of you would like? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating because you can't go anywhere. Like you kind of got to get lucky to move up a lane or so. Like I was, I was, I started on the bottom and I was able to move up to the third lane, but you got to go back to the bottom somehow by the time you have to pit, if we have green, like pit stops and then there at the end i was just stuck in the bottom lane but i kind of didn't i kind of wanted to be there because that's where you want to be if it re there's a big wreck um because you know everyone kind of goes up the track and and granted they all went down into me and i went flying through the grass but 
it worked out, you know. Um, so I don't know if I like it or not. It's a lot of fun, but you kind of just get stuck. So. Well, congratulations on the top five, Bobby, and good luck to you in the season opener next week. But, Evan, I mean, what a what a preseason clash that was. I don't think we could have really hoped for anything more. Green all the way and a huge dramatic finish to cap it off. Yeah, talk about uh, the two parallels. We were just talking about how it had stayed green throughout uh, and talk about the drivers there about, you know, are we going to see three wide next Tuesday night? Because, of course, well, this was a shorter race. That was certainly a factor, Tim. You would think that when we double the length of the go race seat for 250 miles in that season opener as officially EDAS car returns next Tuesday, February the 11th here on the iRace at Esports Network. A normal start time, 9 o'clock Eastern time, that maybe it'll race a little bit differently but i have no doubt that everybody's gonna race just as hard on the last lap and tonight it didn't work out for everybody it did work out for john gorlinski you mentioned something evan there wasn't a whole lot of consequence tonight you, you throw something to the wind there's no points there's no money you get to learn some things tonight you get to try some things next week there's points on the line. It's the start of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series season. Uh, playoff implications. You start off on the wrong foot. You lose a little bit of momentum. And you could be in for a long season. But uh, congratulations to John Gorlinski, William Byron, eSports, uh, getting into victory lane. We'll see if uh, John can get back there next week or if we'll see somebody new in victory lane to kick off this 2020 season, the 11th season of this eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. That was just a little taste of what you'll see for 20 weeks this season as we get set to do it for real. We'll see you next Tuesday from the virtual Daytona International Speedway as we drop the green flag on the 2020 EDASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series.